So he's been called the child prodigy by Chris Dixon, and he recently closed the $5 million financing round from Andreas and Horowitz. But before that, I'm not going to make this introduction. I'm going to let Neil Swain, the commercial counselor from the Canadian Embassy in Romania, do this introduction. Uh, one more thing before that is that uh, the Romanian government officials were for the first time on stage of How to Web Conference at the seventh edition. This is not the case for the Canadian Embassy in Romania, who is supporting us uh, for the third year in a row to bring Canadian speakers to share their insights with us. Thank you very much for your support, Neil. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think I'm going to be the only person uh, at the show who will be actually reading from the notes. Uh, I don't do this very often. Uh, so my name is Neil Swain. I'm the commercial counselor with the Canadian Embassy. We're very proud to be supporting this. Uh, we think it's a very important event. Uh, my organization is the Trade Commissioner Service. We uh, like to connect Canadian companies in Romania to help them do business here. We let them, help them to invest. We also help Romanian companies and Romanians invest in Canada, and I also connect them with the business and as well as the tech community in Canada. So my job, uh, I re represent the Canadian commercial interests here uh, in areas like ICT, programming, development, and innovation. Uh, there's a lot we can do. There's a lot we, that we are already doing together. Uh, so far, companies like Macadamian, uh, Hootsuite, uh, Redline Communications, Celestica, they've made, they've expanded their families to include uh, some of the great talent in Romania. Now, the, spe the keynote speaker today uh, has history with both Romania and Canada. His story is an example of what is possible when you get smart, energetic, and hopeful people uh, and you give them the opportunity to shine. Um, and I think this is what's, what's happened with uh, uh, Larry. Uh, he went to, uh, uh, when he um, uh, left Romania at the age of three, uh, he and his family, uh, like many, came to Canada uh, seeking a fresh start. Uh, they moved to Ottawa where he went to school and he went to, uh, as well as to university there. At Carleton University, he took the initiative to work uh, part-time uh, with Google. And after graduating, like some Canadians, uh, he moved to Silicon Valley in San Francisco uh, and worked at Twitter. Uh, and after experiencing the startup culture there and having, like many of you, uh, a head full of fantastic ideas, he took one of these ideas and started Envoy. His innovative approach, fueled by his drive to build something new, and this was something when we were talking earlier, he said was very important to him. He wanted to start something from scratch, something that was new from the ground up. Uh, this is what helped him launch this company. And today, Envoy's visitor registration service for the workplace is in over 1,500 offices and 40 countries. And I think we were, we were talking earlier, I think it was 19 languages so far. Now, he attributes his love of customer support and customer service and the idea of helping visitors, which I find is a very, from my point of view, is a very Canadian thing to do. Uh, and he's brought that passion for helping others to his company and to the success of the company. So I'm looking forward to what he has to say today and this very unique perspective. So please help me welcome with his presentation from zero to 15 million, the story of Envoy, Larry Gadia. Thanks so much, Neil. <clears throat> nice. All right, I actually got an intro. This is exciting. Um, cool, awesome. Thanks for having me, everyone. Um, it's my first time actually doing a talk in front of a movie theater, I feel like. There should be something much more exciting up here, but you only get so much. Um, cool. Yes. Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk to you about Envoy and uh, and kind of how um, how I got started with it and where it is today and kind of where we're going with it. Um, it's it's pretty unusual, but um, I mean it just shows after just a whole bunch of work and a whole bunch of a whole bunch of really crazy people saying weird things about the thing you're working on, it can be successful. So, um, yeah, I'd, uh, I'll get started. Um, basically, I started, uh, I was born in Cebu in uh, Romania, right around here. Woohoo, yay, Cebu's out there. All right, good, good. Um, yeah, so I was born there. I was here up until the age of three. My parents did some really sketchy stuff where they, um, they left the country, but they had to keep a child behind because then the government wouldn't know that you're leaving. So my grand or my uncle at the time had to like forge documents to make it seem like I was his kid, and it was a whole thing. 
But basically, they got out. Um, they went to Germany. My mom was a just cleaned houses. My dad picked berries for a living. It was a very exciting uh, um, work they did. And then um, basically, I got to um, I got to stick around back in uh, back in Romania with my grandparents. Um, I eventually went to Germany to meet them, and I got actually smuggled in the back seat of a car so that uh, the German government wouldn't see me, but the um, the Romanians, uh, they did know or something, so it was fine. I don't know. Whatever it was, in the end, I basically got to, to Germany, met up with my parents again, and then we eventually got visas to go live, and this is where I grew up, in Canada. So um, we got to Canada, and Canada's great. It's kind of cold, but it's great. Um, it's kind of cold here too, especially when it rains. And um, it was fun. It was, uh, I basically was there from age of four-ish to uh, 22. And uh, I grew up and all that stuff. I did a whole bunch of stuff in high school. Um, and then basically after some time, I, um, I, I did a bunch of uh, different stuff with with uh, the Google desktop product and like with Google, um, I was experimenting with some of their platform. And what got really interesting is that, okay, cool, well, I, I kind of know this stuff now. And, um, and then I eventually got a job in, um, in Silicon Valley in uh, San Francisco. So I eventually moved out there and then that's the last piece of that little drawing where is, that's basically where I live now. I've been in San Francisco for about six years. Uh, it's a super awesome place. Um, Crazy, but awesome. Um, so, so let me quickly go back to uh, what I was doing when I was basically like in high school and kind of how I got to, to starting Envoy. Um, although I'd love to say I, I played a lot of these games with uh, Warcraft 3 at the time and World of Warcraft, um, what I actually ended up doing was I was doing a lot of reverse engineering back in the day. Um, I was in high school. I really didn't enjoy doing all the high school things people typically do. So I basically ended up doing a whole bunch of um, reverse engineering of their battle.net servers. Basically, um, if you somehow acquired um, Warcraft at the time and, uh, and you didn't pay for it and you wanted to play online but, um, but didn't have a valid CD key, um, I was part of a group of people that made a server that made it so you can play it. Uh, we only did this for the beta, so there was no lost revenues and all that goodness. But um, but it was really fun, and it was really it was really interesting to kind of reverse engineer somebody else's commercial product and turn it into something real that a ton of people would end up using. Um, so then I brought this same kind of thing, except on my own this time, to this product called Google Desktop. Um, Google Desktop at the time was this thing that you installed on your own computer. It was made by Google and you could find files. And uh, Google made it so you can only really find like, you can find like Microsoft Word documents or something. But at the time, for whatever reason, I was using WordPerfect, which, um, which I don't use anymore, but it, it, was, it was pretty good. And, but, but Google didn't, didn't support it. And it was kind of annoying because I wanted it to support it. So using the same stuff I did earlier with the Warcraft stuff, I started doing this Google desktop reverse engineering where I modified the executables such that it would go to my library, which would do the indexing properly and push it back into Google. That, of course, um, was, was very interesting to me, but also interesting to Google. So I got a call one day and I was expecting it was its lawyers. I already had to deal with some of the Blizzard's lawyers for uh, Warcraft in a less positive way. Uh, but Google's lawyers were much more excited. In fact, it wasn't the lawyers. It was the product manager for Google Desktop. And he was like, Larry, um, what you're doing is really weird. We've never seen this before. But what's really neat about it is that we're getting all these people downloading our product now because they're all using your plugin with it. So I was actually offered to have a job at Google. Um, this was really weird. I was 18 at the time. I was on the phone call and I was doing these Google interview questions. And at the end of it, they were really excited. And they're like, great, when can you start? And I was like, well, I, I can't exactly start right now. Like, I, in fact, Canada won't even let me leave until I get a degree or something. Pretty sure your government's the same way. And they're like, wait a second, how old are you? And I was like, I'm, I'm 18, is that okay? And they're like, no, it's not okay. And um, so basically, what we we had to kind of shoehorn it into a um, into an internship. And um, the internship lasted at first for two or three months. Um, it was just a classic internship you'd get anywhere. But um, 
it just kind of kept getting more and more interesting. Um, after the three months, I had the brilliant idea of asking, so I'm going to be going back to go to school. Can I remain part-time by chance? And, and they were completely okay with it. So, um, so I remained part-time and full-time at Google for basically um, four years. It was four years of um, me flying to Mountain View, working there, me flying back, um, going to school and doing all the stuff in school. And, and my school wasn't, w w it was great, but it was no Google. So Google kind of kept me um, motivated and excited and that kind of thing. But, but I don't, Google is much more exciting. Um, yeah, so eventually, four years later, after I graduated, I knew I wanted to kind of start a company. And my manager uh, at Google at the time, she really knew this, uh, this guy really well, uh, Evan Williams. Um, Evan Williams was one of the many CEOs of Twitter. And, um, and I had really liked Twitter. Twitter is a, kind of a unique company at the time. It was still really small. Um, and it was, it was kind of the social thing. It was a startup. They only had like 40 people. And I was like, oh, this is, this is really, um, this is really cool. I should probably like, I've always wanted to do a startup. I've wanted to see what it's like to do a startup. And, and that's actually one of the more important parts. It's kind of seeing what a successful startup looks like before doing it on your own really, really helps. And I had read about that somewhere. So I was like, okay, cool. I should do that. Um, so I graduated. I uh, applied at Twitter through uh, their CEO, and um, and of course, if you somehow get an intro with the CEO, they seem to always hire you. So that's good news, and um, and I joined, and it was great. Um, I joined at a really bad time, though. It was it well, I guess it's bad or good depending on how you look at things. But I joined right before they just went absolutely crazy. Um, and I joined as a systems engineer, like all this time I'd been doing engineering at Google. Um, and then now at, uh, at Twitter, I'm doing systems engineering, specifically part of a team of the people that are required to kind of deal with the, uh, what do we call it? The, the, the TPS, the tweets per second. Um, and it was crazy. I mean, we were getting into the hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of tweets per second. Um, going through the systems and, uh, and I was part of a team that helped kind of scale it. So what's crazy about it is just the absolute rapid growth and, and you kind of, it's really hard to imagine what it's like when you, when you join right where I did and then it just kind of keeps going crazier. And this graph actually ends in, what is it, like January 2010. Um, I left in 2012 and, um, and the, the graph got even crazier. So um, it was super exciting times, but, but what was most exciting is this, it's this crazy growth. And growth is, is a really fun thing because it fixes any kind of problems that you might have at the company, at uh, just like in your life or anything. It's just having crazy growth is super fun, super stressful, uh, which is why I said it's a poor career decision. Um, but it's, it's super fun, um, even, even when you like degrade yourself, but oh well. Um, so I had left Twitter eventually. Um, it was, it got a little, it got a little crazy. And I mean, I joined when there were, how many people? There were, there were like 40 people and I left when there were 1,200. So not exactly the startup I was, uh, I signed up for. Um, and what I wanted is something a little bit, I wanted to build my own thing this time. I wanted to build something that um, I'd, I'd learned a lot at Google and I learned a lot at Twitter. And in fact, it was actually really important that, that I did go to those two. I felt like what I learned there is like super critical for even my day to day at Envoy today. So um, I was looking for something new and I was looking for, for an idea that, that would be something people hadn't done before, something people hadn't really thought about. Um, but I wanted something like a Twitter where it was available for everybody. Anybody could kind of use this or anybody could experience it. I didn't just want to build something for a super small kind of niche um, or, or I was okay with a niche as long as it could expand. And um, one thing, even though I was a systems engineer, I've always been super design focused and I just like stuff that looks good. I think people like stuff that looks good. There's entire industries set around that. And it's surprising, especially in, uh, in enterprise um, and like B2B kind of products where people just don't really care about the way it looks. And in, in my opinion, that's 
actually the number one most important thing about your product, even though it might be, uh, even though the technology is oftentimes important or just like the functionality and that kind of thing. Um, in fact, when you do, if you ever do like a B2B or enterprise company, you often have to do these RFPs and these like requests for proposals. Um, there's never a checkbox on there for, does it look nice? Does it work well? Um, is it enjoyable to use? There's never a checkbox for that, but that's the hidden checkbox that, that if you check that, it often outdoes all the other little checkboxes that, that you do have. Um, and I want a product to be sexy. Um, it's sexy is something that gets people excited. It's, uh, it's something that, that people should look forward to using, something that, that's unusual. And, um, and I, I felt that whatever product I would build would be exactly that. So I was thinking, um, what are these different, what are, what are the different kinds of ideas uh, that, that are out there? And, and while after Twitter, I, I met up with a bunch of friends and they all have different companies. They all went to, um, to different places, but it's, it's interesting. One thing I noticed consistently amongst them is, is kind of what their offices were like. They all kind of had like a nice front desk um, there's usually like a person or two or three behind the front desk and they're there to say hello and to get you coffee and all that. But they would also kind of disappear here and there. They would like, you'd say like, oh, here, I'm here for Bob. And then like, okay, let me go get Bob. So they try to call Bob. Bob, of course, is not at his desk. So then they disappear and go somewhere. Um, and then you're kind of left alone in that lobby for a while. So it felt kind of weird. It's, it, it felt a little strange because at, like in a company like Airbnb, they focus so much on how do you get a really great, um, really great website and really great uh, user experience and visitor experience? But visitors is in for their website. Often, t uh, a lot of the companies, even in the Silicon Valley, just didn't think about their front desk. And I was like, you know what? This is really, um, this is really weird. Let's let's actually think about the physical place as well. And and the physical place specifically, also what they had in place at the time, and not just Airbnb, but basically every company around there and around the world just has basically you have your your disgruntled security guard who's kind of sitting or standing behind the desk, and and they just don't want to answer anything, and they're very not excited about their job, and kind of sets a really terrible first impression for anybody going into an office. So I was like, this is this fits the criteria. I, this is exactly what I want to do, and and I just want to completely change this industry. So I started this company called Envoy, and um, yeah, Envoy has been around now for about two and a half, almost three years, and uh, and really quickly, what is it? It's it's a visitor registration system. Um, this is a picture of it being used at Tesla, and. Um, yeah, it does all the things that, that you would expect out of a front desk. Um, it would it collects all your data. You can sign NDAs and waivers. You can collect visitor photos for security purposes. It sends an email or SMS notification to the host, letting them know, hey, your visitor has arrived. So if they're in the bathroom, they get it on their phone, which they're, of course, using anyways in the bathroom. Um, there's badge printing. Some businesses need to know this is a visitor, this is not. Um, we now also have an app for the employees, so they can uh, pre-register people, they can see who they've seen before, that kind of thing. And uh, we support pre-registration, uh, so that you can say, hey, I'm expecting this person. Uh, we have a ton of integrations and, and just a whole bunch of stuff to make the experience really good. Um, this in no way replaces the receptionist. In fact, that this works best with the receptionist. The receptionist should be there to say hello, to kind of give you, um, to, to like give you coffee, talk to you about your day, make it really seem like a great human experience. And then you can let the computer, or in this case, the iPad, handle all the rest. And, um, and companies like Google and Facebook and Apple, they actually had something like this even back in the day. Um, but it turns out they built it themselves. So uh, I found it to be kind of weird that these companies would kind of build it on their own when really when really everybody needs this. And they didn't release it to anybody either because it was very specific to their company. Um, so basically, we started the company. I wrote the original iPad and, uh, and website for it. Uh, the website also um, included a, um, a Rails backend, and I, I did that too. So, and then I had one of my friends actually help me with the, uh, with the design. And that was, that was really helpful for getting kind of this MVP going. 
uh, published it to the App Store, uh, pitched it to all the friends that I had. It actually turned out that I was at a party, and one of my uh, one of the people at the party worked at Airbnb. And I was like, "Oh, your front desk sucks. You should use Envoy." Um, I said it. Actually, I probably said it even worse because I'd been drinking at the time. But regardless, the dude was interested, and he pitched it to his people, and then they all. Uh, got together and I went into this giant meeting with like nine people, uh, people from security, IT, from legal, from finance, all these different people. I did the pitch. It's like, yo, this thing could be really awesome and it'll be great. Um, and they took it. And then from then, um, it just kept on growing to more and more companies. And even as of today, uh, two and a half years, three years later, it's still growing almost exclusively word of mouth um, and not just word of mouth, but somebody uses it at somebody's office. They see it, they're like, oh, this is really cool, and then they bring it back with them to their own office. And that's how we've been growing to, I guess it's like 1,500, 1,600 people today. Um, yeah, I remember our nice little office. That, that was a co-working space. Highly recommend co-working spaces, by the way, because that's the only place you're going to get equally crazy people um, that are not going to harass you for your terrible ideas. Um, yeah. That was, oh man, I remember that office. It was really, it was really dirty. Um, so then, um, so then it, basically a few months had passed and, and the growth was starting to get really good. Um, it was very clear. It was on upwards trend. Um, our weekends were kind of boring, which is how you can see the little spikes at the bottom there. But, um, but it just kept on getting higher and higher and it was consistently getting crazier. So I felt like, wow, this is really cool. Like it's, it's growing. We had all these real companies signing in as well and they just kept on seeing it. So I was like, you know what? We should raise money. Um, I don't know why, but like, let's just raise money because like the kids are doing it. Like we, we are making good money. Like we actually were making, I think we're, ever since we started the company, we've always been basically revenue positive. Um, which is great, but like, yeah, it's Silicon Valley, you gotta raise some money, so why not? Um, so we went and we raised uh, 1.15 million uh, as a seed round. Um, it was through Angels. Angels is a really good way of doing it for a variety of reasons. Uh, Angels will give you the valuation that you want, uh, or in this case it was a convertible note, and they took the cap that was outlandish at the time. I think it was, uh, I didn't write it on here, and no, I did, it's a $10 million cap. And um, which is pretty absurd, but it kind of worked out. And some some well-known people in here, um, but basically one of them, you know, you have a really good investor when once they invest, they recommend other investors and other people come in because of them. Um, then you know that that investor really likes it, and you didn't just like con them into it. So most of this it started through. I remember pitching to Adam, and Adam was the CTO of Facebook, and um, he just like kind of stared at his shoes the entire time. And then, uh, and then at the end of it, he just looked up and it's like, Larry, this is awesome. Um, I'm going to put in a whole bunch of money. It's like, oh, okay, that's kind of weird, but sure. Um, so that was fun. And then from there, we got Yishan and Toby joined on. Some of these people were my friends. Some people came through others. And uh, we got about 17 angels in our, in our round. Um, so then we had a whole bunch of money. Yay, that means we could finally have an, an office that, that didn't look like complete garbage. And, uh, and it was great. We had our own office this time. And uh, we had space. I think, how many people do we have? Five? Uh, yeah, like nine people. We grew to nine people and uh, in this office. So uh, $1.5 million. We kept on growing it. Same kind of deal. Lots of people seeing it. We grew to, what is it, 500 customers, paying customers. These are all, all, everybody's paying. And, um, and revenues, of course, kept on growing. We're making upwards of 100000 a month, which I remember back... A while ago, I was thinking like, wow, that's a, that's a lot of money, $100,000 every single month. Where's all this money coming from? But it's, it's actually quite great. It just like, keeps on coming. And it, it's recurring. That's the nice part about a SaaS business. It's a recurring revenue. Um, yeah, so it was great. It kept on growing, and, and as it does today. But uh, we expanded to five different languages. We wanted to get some new customers on board that were in different places. Rakuten is part of the reason there, because they're in Japan. They just set up these crazy new towers. And, uh, and then they use Envoy there, so there's a bunch of Japanese people that use it, which is great. Uh, lots of weird symbols, can't read a word that says on the app, but I've been told it's translated correctly. Um, okay, so still word of mouth, even at this point. Um, and then I was like, all right, cool, it's, it's April 2015, more than a year since the previous fundraising. And again, we're doing really well. 
Um, and, and again, I had the bright idea. It's like, oh, we should raise more money. Yeah, this is going to be great. We're going to, like, we're doing really well. There's no better time than when you're doing well to raise more money. So, um, so we had barely even spent the million dollars that we, we received before, but we felt like, okay, let's, let's do, let's raise lots of money and let's like, let's go crazy and, and, and just like try to ask all these people that we've heard about on the news and all that. So Andreessen Horowitz ended up putting in $15 million into Envoy. Um, they're, they're awesome people. It's the entire company is, uh, is just full of, it, it's a big, it, it's a big firm. They, they have like, what is it? Like four, like 400 people that work there or like 300 or something insane. But, um, the general partners are really helpful. And then they have all these things like EBCs where they bring in a whole bunch of fortune 500 CEOs in and you get to pitch to them. Um, they, they just have all these people that help you with HR. It's kind of like a company that builds companies. Super awesome guys. Um, we did the whole thing for in about four weeks end to end. First week was negotiation. We talked to all the major people. Um, and Andreessen Horowitz was the one that was most excited and most wanting to, um, to actually, uh, invest in this and at the valuation and stuff that we wanted. Um, Week two was the term sheet. I remember lots of super sweaty phone calls with Chris Dixon. Um, he's, he can be very rough on the phone, but, uh, but it's okay because he did end up doing an investment. Um, but yeah, it was really great. And then week three was uh, diligence. Um, that's basically where they look at all your records and see if you've been making up numbers and if your bank account really is a bank account and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then week four is more of that, except uh, near the end of week four, we got our wire transfer for $15 million. It sucks because they also take a, they take a $30 wire transfer fee, so it's not actually $15 million. It's like 14.99. It was really upsetting when I saw it, but I've been told that this is common, so. Even upset today, I want my $30 back. Oh, percentage, wow, that's even worse. Huh. Um, yeah, so um, basically since then, we've just been growing and, and I apologize, oh wow, you can barely even see that. I apologize for the contrast, but imagine an exponential graph over there and um, it basically has been growing exponentially since the day we started this thing. And, and we measure our growth as a percentage every single month because that's how you measure kind of an exponentially increasing thing. Um, it's it's cool because it's it's real. It's not a cumulative graph. A lot of time you'll see cumulative graphs shown for these things, and it's not really fair because it can't ever go down. Our numbers go down all the time, specifically during Thanksgiving, which is right now, and during um, Christmas, uh, which also it, everything just craters and all the numbers are basically zero. But after that, it goes right back up. And it's really cool because it keeps us in touch that like, hey, if we stop building a product that's really good, people stop using it and this craft will go down. So we have to be really careful to just make sure it's, it's really good. Um, yeah, so we basically kept on growing. Now we're at 1,500. Probably by the time I finish this, this presentation, it'll be 1,600 and it'll be, it'll be great. No, I'm not that, but yeah. Um, revenues, of course, still increasing. We're now in 19 languages, so people can, um, can try it in any kind of languages. We do have Romanian support. Um, it's great. I think it's translated correctly. So I did my rough Romanian read over and it was okay. So that's good. Um, and still no sales or marketing, although we are starting to look on, look at like what kind of benefits these can provide and sales and marketing can provide good benefits, but I'm a strong believer, especially as I've been an engineer. Um, it's the product first engineering first. You have to have an engineering culture in your, in your company. Um, this goes contrary to what you see a lot of the time, but, but having engineers be your prime decision makers is so critical because they're the ones that think analytically. They're the ones that look at the numbers and it's the numbers that matter and not your kind of gut feel a lot of the time. Um, and that's what will really mess with a lot of companies. Um, oh, and, and a fun, fun fact, we have a new cologne that appears every single week. So, so it doesn't matter what kind of product you have, you will have a ton of me too's and a ton of people that just want to kind of clone what you've built and they want to make money too because, because they just want to make money and, and they see like, oh, well, these guys are doing well, we got to do well too. So they do it. Um, we're of course still the industry leader because we were first and we have been executing in my opinion very well, but, um, but new clones every week and it's important not to get kind of discouraged by, by the fact that these things happen. Um, yeah, but it's okay. It's fun. Keeps us on our feet.
super important that you continuously keep building new things or else you, you start getting in trouble uh, because these clones can catch up. So clones really are there to keep you on your feet and building the, the, big, the next big thing. And they're also there for entertainment because it's always fun to see what our website looked like a year ago, which is when they cloned it. So it's like, oh, hey, look at this new clone. Oh, yeah, that's what we looked like a year ago. Oh, that's fun. Um, cool. And uh, we just launched this new product called the Envoy Passport. Um, basically, it's an app you install on your phone. And, uh, and then whenever you walk near or at uh, an Envoy um, company, you, the iPad will detect that you're nearby using BLE. And, uh, and then it'll show you a picture on there. So it's kind of cool because you now, um, now we're building this concept of a network, a network of, um, of people using Envoy for, for kind of this identity and, and using it in the workplace and, and even hopefully in the future outside of the workplace um, as, as kind of this ubiquitous identity. You don't need to like take out your phone, you need to scan some QR code. Um, QR codes are ridiculous. And, um, you can use Bluetooth. Bluetooth is much more fun. It doesn't drain your battery as much anymore. Um, cool. Last two things. Um, we're, we're really, now that we've got this great product, we're, of course, not neglecting it. We still have tons of features that we're building for it. But meanwhile, we still want to do um, lots more things. Um, we want to get in, uh, in like conference rooms. Imagine walking into a conference room, it detecting your Envoy passport, and then automatically booking the conference room for you if it wasn't taken already. This is a big problem in, uh, in bigger businesses. Um, mail rooms, there's a ton of packages, and people just don't pick up their packages, and they just kind of sit there. And um, with, with Envoy, what we want to do is if you walk by the, the, the front desk or the mail room, your phone will vibrate. Hey, you have a package waiting for you. Go pick it up. We're also going to return it. And nobody likes a return package. Um, it, we could, of course, be doing stuff for card access, like how many times do you have those key fobs that you try to put it up to something, and it just doesn't. Uh, you forget your key fob at home, or you forget your little card at home, and then, and then that's a problem. Um, and then, of course, like we want to do stuff with with this confirmed identity. Now you're carrying your you're carrying your identity everywhere you go. And um, we could maybe if you scan your actual like driver's license, what we could do is we can confirm that using certain third parties. And then um, and then whenever you use your Envoy passport, we now know that you actually have a real identity associated with that. So that could be really cool for high security places and, and making it so that it's not this awkward experience where you have to give up like your passport and like five forms of ID. You can just use the one because it knows that you are who you say you are. So um, yeah, we just want to be the central hub of the, uh, of the workplace. Um, it's lots of cool products that we could build, both for the employee, for the visitor, for, uh, for the company, and even outside of it too. But, uh, but I mean, we have to kind of lock this stuff down now. Um, yeah, and uh, we're hiring. So uh, if any of you guys do iOS or Rails, um, please let me know. I'm LG at Envoy.co. Um, we're based in San Francisco. We sponsor visas. We do all this shenanigans, and like we will, uh, we'd be absolutely like, we would love it if um, if you let us know that you exist and and want to help out with this kind of thing. Um, Super crazy growth, highly unusual, but um, but we really try our best to kind of keep down to to the experience of the visitor and uh, and kind of the product. So um, yeah, thanks everyone, and uh, yeah, anybody have any questions? So any questions for Larry? One over there, as well. Um, is it stressful to meet investor milestones? Um, it's not too bad. These guys are pretty good. It depends on the the more reputable an investor. So in my experience, the more reputable an investor is, the more um, the nicer they are to um, entrepreneurs and to engineers. So our investors they push us, but they don't get in the way and they don't they don't force us into things. And they they basically made it clear from day one that we're never going to force you anything. If you want to bankrupt this company, go ahead. I guess we're going to lose our money, but they also see that we're all highly invested in this company and we've all uh, we've brought the company to where it is today. And they see definite growth in. Um, in, in kind of what we're doing. So it, it can be 
it can be stressful setting it uh, myself or like ourselves, but doing it as, uh, but it's, it's rare that an investor will push you into something. And, and I think that that's really what sets apart a lot of the Silicon Valley um, investors, even though there are some around there that basically try to take over your company, but, uh, but that's getting less and less, which is a really, really great direction for investment. Um, it makes it a lot better for the entrepreneur and like the company as well. Anything else? Any other question? We have over there a couple of hands. Um, so we, what kind of integrations do we do with Envoy? Um, uh, there's a variety. We do integrate with Okta and OneLogin to pull the employee directories. Um, we have box integrations, so all the signed NDAs can go into a company's legal box account. Um, we have Salesforce integration. Lots of companies use our product for um, keeping track of leads coming into their office. So if uh, a salesperson is seeing somebody who comes into their office, they actually get that information pushed and updated it on their company Salesforce account. So they know, okay, this person did actually visit. And then we're working on some other integrations with like Lever, for example, for um, talent and, uh, and keeping track of, uh, of interview candidates coming in and out. So that way um, the recruiting team in the company can know who's come in, who did, didn't, how late are they, that kind of thing. Yes. Congrats, uh, it's really impressive. Thank um, you. <laughs> uh, it's all cool and all, but tell us a bit also about the struggle or the biggest challenges that you that overcame um, throughout the time. I personally, my biggest struggle is that everything will go, like I, I just have this mindset that everything will hit rock bottom and go to zero and then it'll all be over. Um, I've been told many times that this is basically impossible at this point, but it's really hard to keep going with the with the growth that we have now and as the numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger it's so much harder to actually achieve this and and as proud as i am to say that like oh we don't have any sales or marketing it makes it really hard even with word of mouth growth to uh to sustain these at these numbers like we're at a thousand we have to add hundreds of new paying customers that's like three a day or more uh paying customers every single day um, and then in a year from now, it'll be way more than that. And it's, um, it's really, really hard to do that. And in my main worries are that we won't be able to sustain this growth. And that's like, we've been known for our growth and that's why we got investment and like that kind of thing. But, but you kind of get used to really high growth and, and it's, um, I, with bigger numbers, the growth will inevitably always slow down. Um, but you definitely don't want it to plateau cause that gets scary. Um, but yeah, let's hope it doesn't get there. One question over there, Mihai. Hey, uh, so it's a really cool technology. It's a B2B B SaaS, right? Yep, that's right. So um, you're saying that each week uh, you have new clones coming in. <laughs> yeah. And you're also saying you're not, you're pretty chill about uh, making sales. So aren't you worried that it's your kind of easy to replace uh, or the clones might just, you know, make sales? Basically, what is your moat, your lock-in for the business? Um, so yeah, there's, there's a variety of things for lock-in, everything. Um, so our first thing right now, which isn't quite lock-in, but we just, as of I think two or three weeks ago, introduced our new free tier. So with the free tier, anybody, uh, as long as you have an iPad, can uh, use our service for free and it works almost full featured. Um, a lot of the integrations don't work and, um, and there's a couple other things that only bigger companies would really care about. But the free plan has been extremely effective at basically curbing all usage of competitors' products. Um, and one of the cool parts about raising $15 million is like, yeah, cool, we'll blow a million dollars on destroying all the competitors. It's not that bad. Um, we, uh, we have, it, like, it's unfair. It's, it's kind of like Andreessen Horowitz calls it like the unfair advantage or something. But it, it helps us because we have the ability to kind of get rid of competitors by, by undercutting them all the way down to zero. And in the past, we were trying to operate a more like, hey, we'll just be, we'll be paid only. But as these, uh, as these clones come on and they just clone what you have and they put no effort into innovating and they're just kind of there to like take some of like what we built and just take some of it. Um, we didn't like that, so we responded by a free plan that, that seems to be working extremely effectively. 
Oh, other, I, I do want to mention actually, so there are other things for growth in a company and, and for keeping users, free is one of them. Another thing is network effects. Uh, it's super important that your product has a way that as you add more people onto it, um, it adds more value for everyone. Um, that's called a network effect. That's what Facebook was extremely um, effective at. And, um, and we are working towards something like that. We're now building the Passport Network, and we're adding more and more features to it that make it exciting to use. And then soon, hopefully, especially when it comes to like multiple groups of visitors visiting offices or groups of people doing stuff together, uh, if they all have Passport, um, they will get uh, the added benefit of uh, functionality that only exists because they're part of a group there, and they're all using the same product. Um, network facts super important. We're already running out of time, but I see somebody over there that uh, wants to make a question. This will be the last question, All and right. we're going to talk with Larry at uh, networking. Uh, congratulations for the 15 million raise. Thank you. Uh, I want to. I have two questions related to the deal anatomy. First of all, I have seen that uh, you have raised uh, people, the num uh, number of people in the company. Uh, you have provided uh, 19 translations, but no sales and marketing. So the most of the money went where? Uh, did, uh, did you have an arrangement with uh, your uh, uh, investors related to the money where the, they will go through? Uh, most On of the, the other hand, you have the advantage that, uh, as you mentioned before, that the uh, 15 it's million. It's only a question, please. Okay. Because <laughs> we're running out of time. Uh, I'm actually enjoying this. Um, no, it's uh, most of our money is uh, it, it goes towards salaries. It's all like the majority of any company's money will always go towards salaries, um, and then marketing steps in at some point and finds brilliant ways to just spend it all. Um, but until then, the people who actually build the product get the money, which I think is kind of the right way of doing it. Um, but yeah, that's where all the money's been going right now, and uh, and I mean we've talent in Silicon Valley is extremely extremely expensive. We pay, um, I mean our salaries are just 100k at least for for a junior developer that just like literally came out of school, um, and then senior developers get easily up into 150, 180. Um, it's expensive, and but you need to pay that kind of money, and you can't undercut these people because. These people are brilliant. They're super smart, super thoughtful, um, and diligent. And unless you pay people what they're worth, you're not going to get the quality that you really, really need in a startup. So um, don't skimp on your engineers. They're super valuable. Cool. Thank you very much, Larry. Thank you.